So for those of you who saw Rebecca's talk yesterday, she talked about the principles and practices behind evolutionary architecture. And today I want to take a little bit of a deep dive into one particular aspect that we talk around, around organizing and governing building evolutionary architectures. So this will be very interesting for a lot of you who are in architect roles. Uh, because there's an interesting implication about how you should perhaps work and uh, lead with your different teams and how that maybe looks if you're taking a building evolutionary architecture approach. Uh, my name is Patrick Quarr. I've been working in technology for about 20 years and uh, one of my passions is about helping technical leaders so people like architects step into new leadership roles. I do training around this and one of the co-authors for Building Evolutionary Architectures. Um, we are actually working on a second edition, which I think Rebecca didn't actually mention yesterday. So keep an eye, on, uh, an eye out for that. Um, it should be coming out probably sometime next year. Uh, but yesterday, uh, Rebecca talked about what is an evolutionary architecture. For those of you who weren't here yesterday, uh, we have the definition of it's, a, it's an evolutionary architecture which supports incremental, guided, not emergent, uh, change as a first principle among multiple dimensions. And so there's something about intentionality that's really important. Uh, and this is one of the reasons we want to talk about fitness functions, which is your mechanism as architects or people who are interested in architecture to guide architecture intentionally. But before we do that, I want to take a little bit of a step back and think about a metaphor. And uh, let's stay with the uh, biological metaphor. And I like gardens, right? So I like to think that software is a bit like a garden. So unlike a little bit of nature, it's not necessarily just whatever grows there, but it's something that you want to be intentional about. And so, you know, one of the things about software is like gardens, you can sort of plan, but what you end up with is not really within your control. You can sort of think about the environmental factors, you can think about maybe what you plant, but at the end of the day, the garden will evolve the way that it evolves. But there are some interesting questions if you get to plan your garden from the very start. And so it's interesting if you think about all the different types of gardens in, you know, in the world. I know for some of the people who are from Munich, there's that famous uh, English garden there. Uh, Tiergarten in Berlin is a little bit more wild, I would say, and maybe not so planned. Um, but this is really the interesting question for all of you who do care about software architecture, is what sort of garden or architecture are you trying to groom? And the challenging part here is thinking about your product and your sort of organization domain. So some of this is going to be constrained by the industry that your company is working in, but also uh, you know, within the particular system domain or application set that you're working in, you're also going to have some small parts that are going to be a little bit different from the broader ecosystem as well. And so a good metaphor I like to think about with good architects is that your software gardeners Right? So you're working with a whole team to maintain a larger ecosystem, and you're not going to be able to control every single plant or insect or things that appear, but you need to think about cultivating the right sort of environments. And so you know, how many software architects think deliberately about gardening? It's a good metaphor. Now, um, the subtitle of this talk, uh, which is a little bit reversed in the program, was around organizing and governing software architecture. Uh, and, you know, an uh, interesting question here is what is governance? So this is the uh, definition from Cambridge, the way that organizations are managed at the highest level and the systems for doing this. All right, very generic uh, sort of definition. Now, if I talk to software teams and we talk about we're going to govern you, what might that bring up in your mind? Right? What do you think of when you think about governance? Most people have this, oh, I don't want like a governance because it means uh, maybe something like this, right? Like people judging us, people coming along and you know saying you can't do that, uh, or you know that's wrong. You need to make a change, or you must do that, right? And a lot of software architects kind of play this role in a lot of organizations. It's part of what you're typically accountable for to make sure teams are sort of moving in the right direction. But this is maybe the more traditional approach to how software architects might think and work within their organizations. You're instructed by your management teams to make sure that teams are working in a consistent fashion. Uh, and the way that you might do that is by coming in, talking to teams, doing architecture, design reviews, giving feedback, uh, hopefully well-received feedback. But you know, a lot of teams feel resistant to that. 
Um, and one of the reasons for this is nobody likes being judged. It's one of the reasons I think that, you know, I prefer things like pair programming versus something like code reviews. Yesterday, Pegida talked about the sunk cost fallacy. And when somebody has come up with that, you know, 1,500 lines of code, they're going to be really resistant to a lot of change because they've invested a lot of time in that. Whereas if you've co-developed that idea earlier with pair programming, people are going to be a lot more uh, open to that feedback. And it's not necessarily about being judged, but it's about just that early information. The other interesting fact for today, given the rate of how many people are building software, is that there's typically only one architect for a lot of different teams or a lot of developers. So you literally can't review every line of code that everyone's coming up with. And so you're not necessarily going to scale yourself. Now, if we combine this with the idea of sort of agile, and I'm a big proponent who's been working in agile fashions for a long time, you know, when you think about agile teams, one of the things that you're often talking about is things like autonomy. And so when people are coming along saying you can't do that, you know, you must do this, it feels like it's constraining some of that autonomy. Now, I don't believe, like yesterday's talk about autonomy, that you know it's a binary thing. You tend to have a bit more of a spectrum of autonomy. So I like to talk about where is your sort of boundary of autonomy or limits of autonomy. Um, and one of the other interesting things, it's often about context. It's about why, right? So you need to do this. You can't do this. But often what's missing behind that is, why do we care about this? And so I want you to imagine uh, an example. And maybe many of you are working in this environment. Imagine that you have your, your organization and you have four different software teams. Um, we give them a lot of autonomy. You know, we're agile, cross-functional teams, we're stream-aligned teams, you can do whatever you like. So each team has their own set of applications or microservices empowered to make technical choices. Now, without any governance, what might you expect after two years' time? We've heard lots of stories about some of the interesting consequences. And maybe one time, two years later, you might end up with this kind of version. Right? It's not surprising. Uh, we expect when things are separated, we're going to have a little bit more siloing. We're going to have a little bit more drift. We're going to have a lot of sort of variance as a result. Now, the important part here is that variance is not necessarily bad. It's more an interesting question about, is that what you want? Are you optimizing for that level of variance? And so in this sort of world where you have a lot of autonomy and not a lot of alignment, you can get a lot of that. And so you know, rules and constraints are important. I've worked for you know, fintech regulated uh, sort of industries, worked in London with a lot of banks, and there are good reasons why there are rules and constraints. And we as software professionals need to think about how do we embed that in? Um, but, you know, how you make sure that people understand the rules and constraints and how they understand that information is really important. Going back to the biological metaphor of gardens, what does nature do? You don't have one person in nature going around saying, you can't do that, right? There's no person who's literally governing how organisms live. And so when we think about this, this is one of the reasons that we often talk about, is it fit for the environment? Right? So if we think about evolution, those species that survive tend to be able to be optimized for the environment in which they live. And of course, there are many different climates or environments, and therefore, we're going to have a plethora of different species. So one of the reasons why uh, you know, Rebecca borrowed this metaphor from uh, sort of the genetic alg algorithm sort of things around thinking about fitness functions, about that mechanism to help guide software evolution. So let's get what we mean by a fitness function out of the way, because I know that there was a lot of confusion about this. A fitness function is simply an objective function that measures how close a given solution fits a particular goal. That's it. So applied to software, if you think about you know, your system that you're building, you're trying to say, we're trying to build an architecture, and, but we're trying to define what do we mean this bit of architecture or this aspect of architecture, if it's good or not, how do we come back to an objective measure? Yesterday, Rebecca talked about maintainability. Right? And maintainability as a word isn't objective. Like We all have you know, what we perceive as maintainable. We can go into a bit of code and we get a sense, is this hard to maintain, easy to maintain? But it's hard to measure. And so the hard part of this is quantifying in some objective measure about what does good look like. So if you're going to use fitness functions, our recommendations for this is you have to think about, firstly, what you care the most about. 
This will be constrained by your industry, the products or the services that you're producing, but it'll also be constrained by sort of the team or the environment that you're working. So, you know, different if you're building perhaps Stripe's API, uh, you know, consumed by uh, thousands or millions of different concurrent clients versus perhaps an internal application used by a handful of people. So you're going to care about different types of traits depending on the sort of domain or applications that you're responsible for. Once you understand that, what you need to think about is quantifying some of this. So you want to sort of think about those illities, some of those architecture uh, sort of traits, and then you want to sort of classify them into the things that you care about and the things that are not so important. So you might hear system quality attributes, cross-functional, non-functional requirements. You then sort of categorize these into the things that you care about right now. Right, so these things will also evolve, but let's just take a snapshot. You know, we're thinking about something at the beginning. Let's focus on what we really care about now. Now, when most people are building a feature, that's not necessarily a conversation that your product people are talking about. And so that's your role as an architect or a person who cares about architecture to make sure that people understand what are the architectural traits that we care the most about for the system that we're actually building. Now, when you think about what's important, it's going to change. And once again, it's interesting to think about maybe some of the tech giants and what they're optimizing for. So Netflix, I think, at least, um, you know, they've optimized a lot for resiliency. If you think about somebody like Amazon, they've really optimized for speed and failing fast, experimentation. If you think about somebody like Google, I think that they're you know, uh, optimizing for strong consistency and also scale across the entire world immediately. But the other interesting thing, and we know this from making decisions, there is no such thing as a perfect decision, no perfect architecture. What are the trade-offs that you're going to optimize for? Right? So they were going to optimize for these things, but at what cost? And that's the other downside, is that you need to also be explicit of if we optimize for these things, we're probably going to have to trade something off. So let's be deliberate about that. So as an example, I think from Netflix perspective, you know, perhaps it's not as simple as possible. Like if you want to launch a new service into production, there's a lot of extra things you need to do if you want your system to survive because they have a lot of uh, sort of automated processes to build resiliency in. If you think about Amazon, so speed and failing fast, what are the trade-offs there? Uh, well, definitely significant duplication and a lot of inconsistency. Like, which AWS API should I be using now? Which server should I be using? There's a lot of different things there. If you're Google and you're looking for that strong consistency, uh, um, you know, you're going to have high coordination costs. Right? Google's known for their mega monolith, their mega tooling, special IDs, special deployment processes. And, you know, there's some interesting trade-offs there. So as an example, you know, uh, if you ever had to do something like GDPR, I'm pretty sure that would have been a nightmare at somebody uh, somewhere like Amazon, right? trying to chase all these independent teams to work out how to do a cross-cutting change across the organization. In Google, at least you can sort of look at all the code at the same place and look at which teams are actually doing things. So there's going to be some interesting trade-offs. And part of your role as architects is really understanding your business to understand what other things that you want to optimize for and therefore, what are some of the acceptable trade-offs? Um, let's talk about some of the evolution of this as well, because it'll also depend on the stage of where your product is at. Um, so uh, you, yesterday, there was the idea of Wardley mapping. Another different way of explaining this is the lean enterprise and the sort of way that products evolve. So they talk about, you know, you want to explore a product. You want to exploit a product once you've found product market fit. That's typically sort of your scale-ups. Then you want to perhaps sustain a product where you've already got sort of very significant market share. So you think about Office; it's not like growing massively, but like they're sustaining it. And then there's a retiring where you know things are no longer there. And so your product will also depend on this spectrum here. And a good example is early days of Facebook. They used to have this saying of "move fast and break things." Right? We want to trade off uh, perhaps uh, like quality. It's okay if people don't get their live feed update for a little bit for a small portion of our users. But we want people to really like, make changes really rapidly. But you might have noticed also Facebook don't use that mantra anymore uh, because you know, a small breakage to uh, hundreds of millions of people around the world is probably not a good thing anymore. And so they actually moved off to this other phrase, which is maybe moving fast with stable infrastructure. Not as catchy. But you know, that's kind of what they're trying to optimize for. They also have some interesting internal challenges around changing culture around that. But this is a, a completely different talk as well. 
Um, but so once you've understand what is important, then you have to define what good looks like. All right, so let's go through a couple of examples. So imagine you have a product and you, you want to optimize for internationalization localization. So you're starting off in one market and you're trying to expand into a different set of markets. You know, one of the interesting things you might say, well, let's optimize for sort of the Western character set. So we'll go with the English-based languages. Um, we're maybe not going to optimize for the non-Latin languages because, you know, right to left is a little bit more difficult or other sort of scripts. Um, and, you know, maybe our target audience is we're targeting all of Western Europe, right? And the trade-off here, when we add in more sort of languages, we're going to have to think about that content cycle. So there is always going to be a trade-off here. We're going to need to review, get translators involved, make sure that we're actually translating various things right. Um, often with like German language, like really long sentences, so you need to make sure that fits in, right? So there's going to be different content uh, cycles. Uh, deployment speed, right? So, you know, let's maybe optimize for monthly releases and move to five or more per day. Now, um, you know, this is obviously a good thing. Dora tells us a good thing. Everyone sort of wants to do this continuous delivery. We get a quicker turnaround. But the trade off is we're going to have to do an investment, right? So, if you're not optimized to do daily deployments, somebody is going to need to build that automation, somebody might need to change the architecture so you can actually deploy things more frequently, and you get more confidence deploying frequently, safely, uh, with assurance. So as architects, we've defined what we care about, we've tried to define what does good look like. And so to think about this, I'd like to come back to what does good product management look like. If you think about good product management today, um, you know, hopefully you're not in a sort of feature factory where somebody is telling you, please build this feature, here's a long backlog of feature requests. What I see with really good product management today is, you know, when you have cross-functional teams, value, uh, sort of stream aligned, they understand what the business outcome is. And their product manager is really trying to say, okay, you know, we're in the growth team. What we're really trying to do is nudge conversions. Like we have lots of users sign up, but right now what we don't have is a lot of people that really convert into paying customers. So what we're really trying to do is focus on outcomes, right? So here's our business metric of how many people sign up, a proportion of people who convert to paying. We want to do things that maybe increase conversion to paying customers. Let's as a software team, build some hypotheses about features that we can uh, sort of think about and actually see what we can do to nudge that. Similarly, this is what you should be thinking about from a good architecture perspective. Good technical leadership is not telling people, here is how you should be doing things. We should really be focusing on providing, you know, here is the thing that we're trying to aim for. There could be many different ways that we can achieve this, but let's define what does good look like for our technical teams. And that's really the essence of why we really want to emphasize uh, um, fitness functions. So for us, these things help us define a good outcome without specifying the implementation, right? Creating autonomy for teams to think about how they, how they achieve that, but you're helping the teams understand what is good and why that's important. So once you've identified what's good, uh, what you care about, what is the specific objective criteria, then we can think about defining some fitness functions. And as um, Rebecca mentioned yesterday, we like to also talk about these things as guardrails. Safety net, right? So development teams try to do the best thing that they can and they're optimizing, but they're optimizing for their world, right? Without feedback about, you know, decisions, uh, um, you know, they might make a sort of wrong move. And so the guardrails are there to help them sort of get early feedback about a, is a decision a good decision within the broader context. Now we're going to see a lot of different types of fitness functions. Um, and one of our encouragements today is really to think about things that you could automate over the human side, right? So earlier, if you do do sort of human-driven uh, fitness functions, it comes back to that hammer that I was talking about, that judgment, that sense of shame. I did the wrong thing. I'm sorry, right? So um, try not to do that. Is that you know really focus on automation because you know people can argue with your ID, your compiler, but you know they're not going to take it personally. Whereas you as a person, as an architect, if you keep coming back to that same team again and again, telling them they're doing the wrong thing, they're probably going to start avoiding you, which isn't a great thing, and they're probably not going to have a good relationship. So try to avoid the hammer. Prefer um, the uh, automation, but maybe it's not necessarily appropriate, or the investment's not necessarily worth it. So let's go through some real-world examples, so some common cases that I've seen on teams and products and talk about what would a fitness function look like for that particular scenario. 
Right, so the first one, uh, you know, how do we get teams to build resilient services, right? So our problem statement here is we're building a streaming service that is used worldwide. We can't afford major downtime, therefore we want to make sure our systems are as resilient as possible, right? One potential solution, and this is how we used to do things, is that let's add a testing team who, like, tests for resiliency. Very normal human approach. We have a problem, let's throw people at it. Now, you know, if you have a couple of different product teams, that might work for your environment, and you have this testing team that's, you know, testing the resiliency of each bit of software. But if your sort of product teams are sort of growing, right, so what happens if we add some more product teams, then this poor team is probably not going to scale at the same amount, right? So you're going to end up with some organizational bottlenecks, and you're going to get some contention of scheduling, work in progress, and all the things that you heard from lean methodologies before as well. Right? So this is why we don't really recommend the human approach, is it's typically not necessarily the scalable approach. And so you know, the approach that has been adopted is, you know, can we scale this, is use you know, great automation. We have good technology. We have great worlds. And this is the birth of the Simeon army, right? So this is effectively where Netflix came from, of thinking about resiliency, thinking about how do we actually build this into our environment. So um, for those of you who don't know the Simeon army, it's a bunch of different tools. Uh, there's things that you know slow network connections down. There's things that turn on and off services. Uh, you know breaks. Uh, you know. Yeah, breaks like network connections, tries to restart services. Um, and you know, if you're a product team, and oh yeah, I should mention that these things are running in production, right? So if you're a team, you deploy your service, then there's these automated mechanisms that are effectively breaking your service. Now, if you haven't built this in, then effectively you'll get a lot of paging and alerting, and you'll have to actually fix this, right? And so this is built into the environment. And so no person is coming along to each team and saying, you need to put in a circuit breaker. You need to think about retries and timeouts. You know, the teams are automatically getting this feedback, and their software simply won't survive the production environment unless they build it in. Right? So an automated fitness function. Now, the Simeon Army um, doesn't really exist in its current form. It has actually also evolved as well. Um, but this is a good example of an automated, right? So there's no human involved. It's a continuous, it's running continuously in production. Right? It's not a scheduled type of job, but it's just running as a background service. And it's a holistic fitness function uh, that's testing the entire suite of applications. Right? So it's testing in a production environment, how it's interrupting with other services. Uh, it's testing everything, interacting with everything at the same time. If you'd like to learn more about each of these, the Chaos Monkey there uh, still has its own GitHub repository, but um, a couple of the other tools have moved into some of the other advanced uh, Netflix things. As a reminder, none of this comes for free, right? And so Netflix, for instance, have had to do a lot of investment in building these tools, right? They've probably had to also train a lot of their technical teams of when their systems break in production, how do they actually go about solving this? Right? They've had teams that have solved this in their sort of environment before, but if you're a new development team that's just come in, you also need to learn these approaches. It's also typically going to be a lot slower to innovate. Right? So if you're just trying to drop a service in to test if there's a market appetite, and there's the automated services running in production, you have to think about resiliency from day one. Right? So there's going to be some trade-offs. Let's take a different sort of um, challenge here. So, you know, layered architectures, we love layered architectures, three-tiered architectures. Um, and, you know, this is a common thing, is that, you know, we draw our beautiful architecture diagrams. Our code doesn't look like that at all, but we want it to, right? So, you know, what we want to have conceptually is a sort of stack where everything is calling in one direction down, right? So, the user interface calling the service layer, calling persistence, maybe calling utilities. We know, in general, if you know, something like a utility class is calling out like a web class to do something like formatting, this is going like, to make change a lot harder. Suddenly, cyclic coupling, like really hard to sort of break things apart. Now, we want to avoid that where possible. And we can do this through things like code reviews, right, inspection. Um, we can do this through things like design reviews, right? So how are you thinking about sort of structuring the code? Um, and maybe you capture this in older systems when you maybe do an architecture review once a quarter or once half a year. So this process doesn't typically scale, and you're going to miss some of those elements. Because literally, you know, if you're one of those developers like with those great IDEs, you, know, you just simply look at a function. You go probably auto-import. 
it sort of auto-completes. You're not really thinking about layering at the time. Like, I've done this myself. I'm sure you've all done this, right? Got great auto-completion. We're not really thinking about layering, uh, and uh, nobody typically looks at those collapse perhaps imports or modules that are sort of you know, hidden away from our IDE. So how would we build a fitness function for this? Well, the good thing is we have a lot of different tools that help us detect this. So uh, I've done a lot of Java, so a few of my examples are from here. Uh, one of the tools that's available in Java is called jdepend. It looks at dependencies. And one of the things that it actually has is something that says, you know, does it contain cyclic dependencies across sort of package spaces? And so in this sort of case, we're plugging this sort of automated tool into a, you know, testing framework that we can simply run as part of our build process. All right, so something that says, let's avoid um, cyclic dependencies. The great thing about something like jdepend is you can actually be a lot more specific as well. So rather than just cyclic dependencies, you can actually define package layers and say, OK, we have these different types of layers. And we want to explicitly say, this package web depends on the utility layer. Uh, this repository layer depends on the utility layer. Web depends on repository. And if we have any violations, then fail the build. Right? So great way of getting some feedback as part of that. Now, the important part with fitness functions is this is the idea, and there's going to be different types of implementations. So for this particular example, um, you know, when, um, this is how I used to do it when I was like back in the days actually writing a lot of code. But you know, since then, Java has evolved. Uh, one of the mechanisms, for instance, Java 9, is the use of explicit module spaces. Right? So you can say, this module can only access classes from these modules. And literally, people can't access functions or code from other types of modules because it's statically enforced from that particular side. Another great tool in the Java space is something called um, ArchUnit. Uh, there's a person called Thomas here who knows who's a contributor. Uh, I'd recommend reaching out to Thomas. He, he knows a lot about ArchUnit right at the back there. Um, and it's a tool that allows you to sort of test your architecture for different aspects and elements. And uh, as an example, I had a look at the documentation, and one of the things that you can do is say, you know, a little bit of a DSL here. So no classes that reside in package repository should access classes that reside in, say, web. Right? So we don't want a lower layer accessing a top layer. And then this can actually be enforced through that tool. And the great thing about something like ArchUnit is it's not just about uh, package access or layering. It has lots of other things that you can think about to test your architecture without testing the implementation and having to manually do this. So what I really love about these sorts of approaches is you have to be clever in how you think about how you implement some of these fitness functions, but it's different types of implementations. And this example is a good example of an automated, right? So it's running um, you know, automatically through our build process. It's typically a triggered fitness function, so it doesn't run all the time. It only really runs when somebody is making a change, and that's plugged into our build process. And this is what we would describe as an atomic fitness function, because it's only testing one aspect of our architecture in a fairly isolated manner. All right, so a lot of you probably are working in microservices. It's like a very popular uh, style of architecture. So one of the common challenges you have, and I've seen this many times, is you have lots of teams building things. And then your poor ops team is going, how are we going to monitor like these hundreds of services? All right, how do we make each service monitorable in a relatively easy way? Right? So what you don't want is like you know, five teams coming up with five different monitoring solutions or uh, sort of approaches. And so once again, you might have those naive approach where you say, OK, this is an operations requirement. Every team needs to go off and implement this feature of a monitoring endpoint. Of course, how do we enforce that? We need to inspect that. So let's make that part of our acceptance criteria. Uh, and of course, you know, somebody's going to tell you if you did it or not. Right? We want to avoid this situation. And the great way that we've seen with a lot of teams implementing good fitness functions is thinking about what you can do to piggyback this into your continuous delivery pipeline. Right? So which part of our pipeline would we put something like this? This is really ideal after we've sort of deployed our, our sort of service. We're about to run perhaps something like a, a UAT or an integration test, something where it's sort of testing a little bit more in a holistic environment. Uh, and we want to plug in some of fitness functions in this case for this situation here. So a simple um, implementation of this concept would be simply something like this. Right? So let's have an automated test. Each service has a status page. What we have here is basically here is whatever the random service is. And we should agree as an organization where that status page should sit, right? so slash location. 
I should be able to do a, a sort of ping or a get, and I should get something back. If I don't, that team needs to probably go off and actually implement this. All right, so you're dropping this in. The team can implement it in whatever web framework, whatever library, or whatever mechanism they'd like to have, but we're describing what does good look like. You might go a little bit further as well and not just simply say, okay, here's the status page, but here's maybe information we should also pull out, right? So is it functioning well? Are there any errors or uh, some other information that you care about? These are discussions that you want to discuss with your sort of organization and make sure that people um, are thinking about what does good look like. This is a good example of a automated, uh, so similar to the last one, triggered and atomic testing. Is this service uh, monitorable from that perspective? Let's talk about a very different type of uh, um, uh, fitness function. And this is really about content, right? So content is hard because it's like subjective, right? And what I really love is, we've got a really good example. Um, and think about government websites. I live here in Germany and I've looked at a lot of German government websites. Really hard to understand, right? So if you think about a government website, what comes to mind? Probably have like lots of this. In the UK, they went through this process of saying, we want content understandable. And so they described good content should be readable by a nine year old. Now, here are a couple of pages from their um, sort of website, renew your license, right? pretty easy to understand. Now, at the time of when I was like involved as part of the GovUK project, um, there wasn't really an automated process here. Somebody had to go and review content, right? So this is built into their process. So this is a case of a manual fitness function, periodic, because you're not necessarily testing content all the time. Typically, you're changing a whole area and atomic. But over years, we've got some great tooling now. So if I was to think about the potential next step, you know, we've got things like Grammarly and Hemingway. They can actually tell you, you know, what's the readability score, the age of that based on sentence length, the types of words that are being used. If they had a great API, you could imagine plugging this in to a build process to actually automate this sort of content. Just quickly, you know, security is an important topic. And so, you know, we all probably remembered the log for shell problem that came out at the end of last year. You know, once again, naive solutions say, let's do reviews. Uh, you know, we only use approved libraries. Um, and you can all imagine all developers going, oh, no way, we can't do that. Now, we do have some good advantages, and GitHub have some really good examples where they have this CVE security scanning process. So if you have a GitHub repository and it's using a library that has a known vulnerability, you will get an alert typically that says, hey, you're using a library we know that has a severe vulnerability. The great thing about these is that these things are low effort. Uh, you decide what to do and it scales a lot better than humans do. This is a good example of automated, continuous, and atomic testing that sort of one dependency. All right, just quickly, on security, and I want to talk about this because I worked in some regulated environments, is if you have worked in regulated, you get a lot of these types of things to do with uh, security control. So, you know, imagine that you just have a, uh, a requirement to lock down your production servers, right? You say, uh, you know, for these types of servers, we're only going to have port 443 open, right? That's your thing. If you're regulated, you typically have to document this and then you have to prove this, right? So this is typically a very onerous pro pro process. So how do you... How do you typically prove this? Well, you typically need a team who has uh, maybe production support access, who's on call, and they can actually you know, go in and audit things as well. Um, and you know, then you have to go and review these sort of processes. But we can improve this, right? We can write scripts that say, okay, let's find out what ports are open. We run this maybe once a week, and then we provide that catalog. We've now got a lot more tooling because of the sort of integration of DevOps and DevSecOps in that we can actually use a lot of tooling like that. And one of the tools I'd recommend you use is things like InSpec. So something like this is an automated testing suite that says, OK, um, firstly, here is our statement. So only port 443 should be opening and listening to HTTPS. Shouldn't be operating port 80. You not only specify this, but you can actually run these tests on your production suite and get a, uh, you know, on your production servers and get a report about what's violating. The fantastic thing, uh, like ArchUnit, is you can test many other aspects as well. So making sure that certain uh, packages like curl or telnet aren't installed, as these are sort of uh, threat uh, vectors. So as a reminder, think about what sort of garden you'd like. Think about what is important. Define what does good look like for each of those traits. And make sure that you define some fitness functions that you really care about. As a reminder, building evolutionary architectures is really thinking about architectures that support incremental guided change 
that uh, um, uh, as a first principle among multiple dimensions, and you know, really think about what types of fitness functions that you would like to guide good, uh, what good looks like for your particular architectures. I'd like to leave some time for questions now. Thank you. You could have thanked him a little longer. So uh, we have a lot of questions. We won't have time for all of them. But here's one. How to avoid overfitting, i.e. accept two large trade-offs? Don't fitness functions suffer from Goodhart's law that a measure that becomes a goal ceases to be useful? Uh, it's a great question. And um, what I've found is this isn't something that you simply do to your teams, right? Like a bad fitness function, like a bad metric, is sort of saying somebody is going to evaluate you now, go off and do that, right? Like that's not how we're encouraging to, to do these things. Part of this is having conversations with the business, making sure that you understand, okay, here is where the business is heading and here are the things that we care about, and also then going to the teams and helping provide that context why. If you can bring them together and make sure the teams hear it directly from the source, even better. But you really want your teams to really understand the intent of why these fitness functions exist. You don't want simply an automated process that's telling you you're doing it wrong because people will game it. It's a bit like uh, test coverage, right? Like, very gameable if somebody just puts something in and says it needs to be 80%. But if I understand this as a developer of saying, okay, test coverage is there to help me understand, like, maybe I cut corners on some of the test cases. Um, I added extra code where I probably, because I'm not doing test-driven development, it helps me improve because I understand the purpose of that. So um, I go back to Simon Sinek, start with why, is that when you're um, using these things, it's not about the metric, it's about helping people understand, A, uh, these things are important for a good reason, right? There's gonna be some business reason or uh, technical strategy reason why you want it. Um, here's what we've currently defined as good looks like, and you can get this information at any time hopefully, if it's automated, right? You're not waiting on me. You don't have to set up a meeting. Nobody likes meetings. Uh, and you, know, you don't have to wait for that feedback from an external party because you have it in your environment. So make sure that people really understand the why, and hopefully, you can avoid some of that. Thank you. So here's a question that has been voted up by a lot of people. How would you start using fitness functions and systems not supported by a framework like ArchUnit, JDepend, et cetera? Yeah, so I'm uh, um, a big sort of lean person. So um, one of the lean things I think is start with bottlenecks, right? Like one of the things that you should probably talk to your teams is, is like what's the most painful thing about your code base, right? Like um, what's, some, what's some characteristic um, that you care about that is being neglected, and there's gonna be a lot of them, uh, and that we really care about that we all want to change, right? So maybe somebody says, oh yeah, you know, that security team, really painful whenever we try to go to release. Um, you know, can we do something about that, right? Like, what can we do about that? Try to understand what's the biggest pain point and then discuss what might be first good, uh, sort of what's the objective criteria and then start small. So try something small. Um, that's one of the reasons I wanted to show you that you know, we have different types of fitness functions. You might start off with a manual fitness function, right? So rather than saying, okay, we have security review right at the end before we go live. Let's at least bring that sort of process forward as part of a design process, maybe threat modeling, and we start off there, right? Let's improve the feedback loop, um, and then we can think about maybe finding automated approaches to get better feedback around that. So I would always start with the bottleneck, the most painful part. I would always start small. That's the agile approach of something that helps you take a step forward and improves the working environment. Um, hopefully, you get some feedback, it's helping. And then I would think about then, you know, the next sort of progression of saying, okay, can we make it faster feedback? Can we automate this? Uh, or can we improve the quality of that information as well? Great. Last questions. In terms of governance, how important do you think it is to have a consistent tech stack across teams? For instance, only language X or database Y, when does it make sense? So I'll go back to the, it depends, but... Um, this really comes back to what you're optimizing for. So one of the reasons I wanted to give you the example of things like Google versus Amazon is, um, you know, it depends on what you're optimizing for. So for instance, Amazon has a lot of, you know, different technology stacks. And they're designed it that way, right? So two teams can only talk to each other through APIs. And that means it's, in, it's okay if those two teams have completely different tech stacks because Amazon don't really want to swap people from team to team. 
right? Whereas in some way like Google, you tend to get more consistency within a product because people can move then from one product to another and they're not learning a new tech stack. They're already familiar with a lot of the tooling. They have to learn a lot more about that domain. So the interesting question you have to ask in your organization is, you know, how often are people moving across teams? How often do you want that? Uh, how much, say, innovation do you want? Because if you, if you don't want a lot of innovation, then you only have one way. Uh, if you want to have lots of different variances, that will give you some different experimentation, so set-based design, that you might be able to pluck the best thing. But you have to be very deliberate about that. And so I can't really describe what you want in your teams and organizations. Most companies are somewhere in the middle, right? So most companies are kind of maybe within a product group. You want to maybe move people around uh, different teams in that group. So I would try to have a tech stack that's relatively consistent within that product sort of set. But maybe if you have different product lines, maybe it's okay that they're completely different technology stacks because you're not going to have people moving between them. And so you're not necessarily going to want to optimize for sort of switching costs. Great. And then the last thing is a comment, and I think that speaks from all of us. A big thank you for the concrete examples. Thank you very much.